Life during a siege is something that is often depicted in movies in very intense ways, and despite there being some truth to that, the way that sieges actually played out and the quality of life during a siege was much different than what we see on the big screen. Today we are going to be discussing what life was like during a siege and how people on the attacking and defending sides tended to live. Make sure you stick around until the end of the video to see how hard it would have been to survive a siege throughout the Middle Ages. A siege is a warfare tactic that involves a military blockade of a city, castle, or fortress with the opposing forces intentions being to seize and conquer. It's seen as a form of low intensity but a constant conflict that mainly occurred when a defending site held a strong position at a strategically advantageous location. The art of siegecraft is something that has been developed over centuries and still used in modern warfare today, though on a much different scale. The winner of a siege is often decided by thirst, starvation, or even disease, though some sieges throughout history were more aggressive than others. Being on the offensive side of a siege typically meant you were at the disadvantage, at least until the invention of gunpowder-based weapons. That isn't to say the tactics of the attackers were any less viable than the defenders. Many armies throughout history have managed a successful siege because of a few tactics that developed over time and became common practices. As an attacker, the beginning of the siege can be key to a successful outcome. In some cases, like back in 1221, when William de Force attempted to capture Fotheringhay Castle, the attacker will attempt to overwhelm the defenders quickly with a surprise attack before they had a chance to prepare themselves. And while this worked for them, that tactic typically led to failure. What became the most common practice of an attacking army during the siege was to allow their presence to be known and begin setting up a siege camp in hopes of the enemy's surrender. During the beginning of a siege, especially during the medieval period, negotiations would take place with the attacker, hoping they could persuade the defending fort or castle to surrender or possibly even convince someone inside to betray their defenses. More often than not, it's reported that the attackers would propose a generous offer to the defending fortress at the beginning of a siege, simply because they knew the cost that came from attempting a siege. The Attackers might have even offered to allow defending troops to simply march away with their lives and their weapons if they surrendered. So it should be noted that if a defending commander were to surrender too quickly, it might have been seen as a sign of treason, which would have caused them to be executed by their own side. But if the defending side didn't submit and the siege progressed, the attackers would begin to set up earthworks and other means to cut off any supply routes or escape routes to and from the besieged area. Circumvalitation is the process of a military surrounding an enemy fort using barricades, armed forces, and other earthworks to prevent entry or escape from the besieged area. This was in hopes of eventually dwindling the supplies inside of the defending fortress or castle and either starving or forcing out the defenders and eventually winning the battle. If starvation didn't work, the attacking forces often resorted to using biological warfare. This meant using catapults or similar artillery and weapons to fling disease-carrying animals over city walls, which would then spread among the besieged fortress. Now, if an opposing force wished to speed up the pacing of the siege and bring it to an end more quickly, various forms of counter-fortifications were used to lay waste to the defenders. These included siege engines, ladders to climb defending walls, and battering rams to help tear through gates and barriers. As the art of siege warfare progressed, heavier artillery was created and deployed, such as trebuchet, in Ballyste. It also became relatively common for the attackers to attempt to dig tunnels underneath fortifications in order to weaken their structural integrity and cause them to collapse or sometimes explode. However, more often than not, despite the efforts put in by the opposing forces, if a siege was prolonged, the defender oftentimes came out on top. This was mainly because of the advantages that came with being on the defending side of a siege. Not only did this mean that you were typically inside of an already pre-built and pre-fortified structure, but it typically meant that time was on your side more than the attacking forces. The most important factors when it came to defending an outpost were the defensive fortifications and taking account of the supplies stored within the besieged area. In fact, food and water were so important that if the supplies were low enough, the defending forces would drive out what they referred to as surplus civilians. This mainly included the lower class and the poor. This would lower the demand for the supplies stored within the fortress or castle allowing the food and water to potentially last longer. While inside a defending fortress, if it was discovered that the attackers were attempting to dig tunnels underneath the walls to destabilize the foundation, the defending forces would pump smoke into the tunnels using large bellows, 
This would then suffocate the intruding forces. And much like with the tactics used by offensive forces during a siege, the defensive tactics continued to adapt over time. And by the time of the medieval period came around, the defensive fortifications, such as the ever-important walls, got progressively stronger. Fortresses also saw themselves being lined up with devices known as machicolation, which is an opening in the floor where the defending forces would drop stones or boiling water through and down onto the enemy below. By the time the Middle Ages rolled around, most large cities throughout the world had massive stone walls to protect their citizens in the event of a siege. On top of that, a massive effort was put into securing large and stable water supplies within cities to ensure that starvation and dehydration would not be as likely. And as we said, until the invention of gunpowder and gunpowder-based weapons, which allowed the attacking forces to fire projectiles at a higher velocity, the defending side typically had the advantage in the event of a siege. Now, when it came to living conditions during a siege. Neither the attacking forces nor the defenders really had it easy, despite what some films might have you believe. When it came to attacking during a siege, setting up and living in a siege camp was no picnic. Yet in almost every movie or show that depicts a siege tends to make it look like the attackers are essentially able to just sit around and wait all day until the defenders give up. But that wasn't the case at all. As a soldier who's part of attacking forces, you would have virtually no free time at all. You would either be working to improve the defenses or around your camp, actively trying to attack the defending fortress, or if you're lucky, sleeping. The schedule during the first hours and days of a siege is presumed to have been particularly light, and until the defenses around the camp were completed, every guard was placed on watch duty for at least a third of their time. Once the defenses had been set up, most of the guards still had to cycle through watch duty to ensure that they were safe while they figured out the rest of their plan. Those who weren't on watch typically had other equally tasking jobs. This included things like foraging, going on raids at local townships, patrolling the area for anyone that was trying to escape, and bringing supplies to the defending fortress. Or perhaps they could use that as leverage during the siege. Now I'm sure you can imagine that a camp full of potentially hundreds of soldiers with no way to clean themselves was a fairly filthy place, and during that time with filth came disease, one of the primary concerns for a siege camp. On top of that, if an opposing force was far enough away from their homeland, their bodies and stomachs would have had a hard time adjusting to the climate and the microorganisms in the area, which made illness even more prominent. That was something that the defending forces didn't have to deal with, seeing as their bodies had already been acclimated to the area around them. With limited fresh water, and poorly improvised sewage systems, diseases like dysentery was common among siege camps and led to countless deaths. This is actually what caused King Henry V's death during the siege of Emu. A stable food source was also scarce, but important aspect of a siege camp. In movies such as 2010's Robin Hood, you'll notice that opposing forces in siege camps would often send parties out to go hunting for game in order to keep them well fed. Well, this was far from true during a real siege. While hunting parties did go out in search of food, the area would often be overhunted within a matter of days if the opposing force was big enough and need enough food. So in reality, most people during the siege were not eating well, whether you were attacking or defending. When it came to sleeping arrangements for soldiers at siege camps, it wasn't like what you see in the movies. In Hollywood, they make it seem like it's a city of tents with every soldier being able to sleep in some sort of shelter. In reality, tents were rather expensive during that period, and even up to the mid to late 1400s. Up until then, it was generally accepted that if you were in the military, there was a good chance you were sleeping outdoors in possibly harsh conditions. Now, if a soldier could afford it, a tent was one of the most important pieces of gear to keep themselves safe from certain illnesses and the weather. But at the price of two pounds, which equals 160 days of pay for a common foot soldier, that was a dream that most soldiers felt was unattainable. Now, despite having slightly better living conditions, being on the defending side of a siege wasn't much better. When it came to food, even if the defenders had a large supply stored up, they would still have to ration it heavily to ensure it lasted as long as it needed to. And if the food supply had dried up, they would have to either starve or take more drastic measures. If defenders were starving, they would resort to eating anything vaguely edible. This meant horses, leather from shoes and clothing, family pets, and even each other under the most drastic of circumstances. And much like the opposing forces, those defending or living within a city or fortress that was under siege Disease was a constant worry, especially if the attackers are launching disease-riddled animals over the walls. What do you think you would have done if you had been alive during a siege in that time period? Would you have preferred to attack or defend? Make sure you let us know in the comments below. 
And if you've enjoyed today's video, leave a like and subscribe to ensure you don't miss a single upload.